Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. This is Trading Spaces. You and I do them every Monday and Wednesday. Um, we're going to start doing them at 930 on the opening here. Um, and bang yeah, we're, just, we're, we're trying some things out, peeps. Relax. Yeah, we are. Um, okay, so guys, let's let's just quickly recap what happened late last week. It seemed that there was going to be somewhat of a de-escalation, and maybe that the financial, um, some of the uh, you know the restrictions or the sanctions weren't going to be as bad as people thought, you know. And then over the weekend, the West kind of got their act together and they got a bit more severe. And then, you know, the the fear was that we might see some sort of like systemic risk, but then that was put aside. So here we are, we got a market down 1% after a rip roar in a couple days, Thursday and Friday is the market. If not, if things don't get worse from here over there, and that's just one situation um, is the market okay? Is it going to try to find its footing? The stock market, that is. And and listen, let's be clear. A lot of other markets are going haywire. Energy markets have gone haywire. Credit markets have been very yeah. volatile. Uh, currency markets are obviously insane. What, what's your take right here? When you say insane, that's a, that's the exact right word to use. I mean, the currency markets are insane. You see some of the moves, they're, well, again, they're historic moves. I mean, what, so what are my thoughts? Well, I think you outlined it really well. This is just one Again, through the lens of markets and what moves markets, this is just one aspect of what's been going on for quite some time. I mean, this is just one more piece to this puzzle, but it's not the only piece. I, I think I think if, if people believe that the market has sold off solely on the back of what's happening in Eastern Europe, I, I happen to think they're mistaken. Um, but it obviously is not bullish. Now, if something happens, if there's some ceasefire, which I don't anticipate, Will the market rally? Yeah, I think it will absolutely rally. And then we're right back to where we were before as to the reason why this market has sold off in the fashion that it has for individual stocks since the summer, um, for the broader market over the last few weeks. And that comes solely down on, again, uh, central banks changing course. Now, there is also the wild card that we've brought up a number of times that nobody seems to now they seem to be chatting about it more. But. You know, what happens? What, are the, what is this empower the China? You know they're sitting back and watching how this is playing out. They're taking their copious notes. How do, how do they respond, one, to what's going on here? And what are their plans with Taiwan? I mean, that's still a huge uh, question mark. And by the way, if you think this Russia-Ukraine situation is market moving, uh, if something were to happen in China-Taiwan, I mean, I think you just put a multiplier of five on the back of that, Dan. Yeah, I, I guess the biggest point away from the geopolitical stuff is that, and you and I have talked about this a little bit, you know, 2021 was supposed to be the year of like some sort of like global reflation, liftoff, post-pandemic, that sort of thing. And obviously Delta in Q3 really kind of nailed Q3 GDP and then Omicron in Q4 really hurt the last month and into Q1 2022. So if we're going to have like this kind of rolling geopolitical dust ups, the issue here about global growth in general and in, in about corporate earnings, I would say also for, for multinationals is that, okay, so if energy prices were likely to subside and we we're likely to see inflationary pressures come in a little bit, assuming without these geopolitical things, things on the other side of the pandemic well that's just kind of been pushed out the way it kind of happened in 2021 and so your point about okay so let's just say this remains a volatile situation but one we can quantify but energy prices stay really high but let's say the energy prices in europe really depress you know european growth um, for 2022 and then there's some situation 
and say with China and Taiwan, and then you have this kind of two prong thing where you have you know supply chains which were starting to get you know really stressed um, during the trade war, and then we had a pandemic for two years. Um, well, then that sticks around, you know. And so I guess the expectation that that I would say for you know eight percent S and P earnings growth in twenty twenty two might be really high. And if you have you know an S and P trading about nineteen times forward, um, which is above the five year average or a little bit um, then or in line ish or something like that, then then all of a sudden you have to start to re rate. You know, we had a we had a co- a conversation on CBC's Fast Money on Friday. We had a guy on Adam Parker, um, good strategist, who was just talking about the S and P at you know maybe back at a reasonable level, expect uh, you know eight percent expected EPS growth for the current year. Well, then my my question to you is, if Apple's the largest component of the S and P five hundred, the Nasdaq, but let's just say the S and P, it's supposed to grow earnings mid single digits this year we know they buy back a shit ton of stock you know tens of billions of dollars so they're massaging their earnings and so it's got a lower expected eps growth rate um, but trades 27 times earnings versus an s&p at 18 and a half that doesn't make any sense does it guy donnie not at all and you know we've talked about this in terms of apple specifically when apple was a growth stock and it was for many years it was trading at a value stock valuation. I mean, at, at its trough, if you back out their cash position, Apple was probably trading at 12 times or maybe even less forward earnings. Now, when it is a value company, again, my opinion, or actually maybe not even my opinion, maybe it factually is true, it's trading at a, at a gross stock valuation. It's somewhat counterintuitive. And Again, you know, we've talked about this a number of times. Personally, I, I don't really care one way or another about Apple. It does, you know, they've done really nothing for me over the years. They've furnished me with phones that I bought, but that's about it. And if, again, if you think somehow Apple magically cares about you, I can tell you they don't. But what I will say is, as we've mentioned, since the middle of 2018, Dan, and you know this, you've seen at least four, if not more, 25 to 40 percent peak to trough declines. And Having made an all-time high of, I think, 183 or actually 182.94, you know, that moved down to 152 last week, was literally to the penny of the 200-day moving average, which was 151.60 at the time. The question is, do we break down? I'll tell you, and you know this, Dan, and we'll have him on with us, I believe, on Wednesday. Carter Worth thinks this is the next sort of shoe to drop, and I don't necessarily disagree, and it's not because I'm some Apple bear, I'm not. Again, I'm ambivalent totally about the stock. And quickly, you know, I'm, I'm getting some comments on Twitter. And Russia is given the green light. This is just some, I think there's some thoughts out there that this, maybe it is true. But Russia Russia's given the green light for global central bankers to continue to print. I would push back on that and say I don't think that's true. As a matter of fact, if anything, this is just going to exacerbate this inflation problem, which was requiring them to sort of do a 180. So I guess what I'll say is, and this is a point that I tried to make on the show last week and on our shows last week, if you think that this is going to somehow give Federal Reserve or central banks air cover to continue to do the same shit they were doing prior, I don't think that's the case. If anything, uh, I think they're going to continue to stay the course because if things do quiet down there, the inflation problem is still with us. And if things continue to escalate there, the inflation problem's only going to get worse, Dan, Nathan. Yeah, that that was, you know, I think one of the things that's very unique about this is that when you think about the last kind of rate hiking cycles and they were fearful of some of the same things, usually it was about risk asset valuations, right? They were trying to tamp that sort of down. Um, They didn't really have too many inflationary um, fears, but that is obviously the case right now, Um, you know, and one of the things that, you know, obviously during the pandemic, any risk asset that wasn't bolted down just got bought. Well, we've been seeing the air come out of that trade um, for a while. Let's talk about bank stocks here. You just talked about rates here a little bit. And so you're saying that, you know, we we have seen the 10-year come in to 1.87 the two-year yield is at 145. You have the spread at 41 and a half basis points. Um, bank stocks have definitely been volatile of late. I mean, for that, I, I guess some fears of like some sort of systemic defaults um, when you, you know, when you kind of trap a certain portion of the global economy and the interlocking or, you know, th- that sort of thing. But 
banks, you know, down two and a half percent here in the U.S. You know, some don't have any exposure, really. Danny Moses, our friend who does on the tape with us, the podcast that drops on Fridays. Check it out, people. Um, you know, he's been talking a little bit about the the differentiation between money center banks that should benefit from higher rates and interest margins and those the investment banks that, you know, had did really well the last couple of years as capital markets activity was, was rip roaring. Well, you see SPAC deals done and, and you're going to see a lot blow up. Um, a big M and a has not been around, right? Um, sometimes in periods like this, you'll see lower trading volumes, that sort of thing. So what do you, what's your take on, on bank stocks, um, in general guy, because, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, Deutsche Bank is down nearly 8% today. I didn't realize that Deutsche Bank literally had this huge move just a couple months ago, went from like 12 bucks to like 17 bucks. And now it's round trip the whole thing. Yeah. And, and obviously this, the thought is that they have the most exposure to Russia or the potential for the most defaults. They say they. They seem to find to get themselves into these situations, you know, pretty regularly, as they say. And you you did this for a living for a long time. And you actually appeared on a show on CNBC for a decade, if not longer, called Options Action. And I, as last I looked, I think Deutsche Bank probably still has the largest derivatives book on the planet. And situations like this, I will tell you, I'm sure they're really smart people there, but I guarantee they're not um, equipped to deal with what's going on. I would say this in terms of banks. If you're trying to figure out what's happening in Europe or what's going to happen in Europe, uh, I think if you don't have letter C up on your screen, you're doing it wrong. And if you look at the move in City recently, uh, had a move up to the mid 70s. Look at where City is trading now. I think it's trading sixty dollars and change. When I say sixty dollars and change, I mean like sixty dollars and fifty cents or so. So you're fifty cents away from having a new handle, as we say in the trading business. I mentioned that because City has probably the most European exposure out of any of these major banks. And I do think, Dan, the low we saw in February of last year was like 58 and a half. So that should be up on your screen. If City starts to give it up here, which it has been doing, by the way, I think that's trying to tell you something. So a lot of times stocks can tell a story. I think you were smart to bring up Deutsche Bank. I'm no fan of theirs, as you know, if you watch Fast Money over the years for a myriad of reasons. And I think city is the one you have to keep your eye on. Yeah. You know, let's, uh, let's go over the semi space. We were talking guy. Um, you mentioned China and Taiwan and, you know, uh, Taiwan semi earlier this year, I think it was in January. They announced like a huge, um, CapEx. I think like the committing to spend $30 billion over, you know, I don't know the next five or whatever years and like build, building fabs, you know, in other places outside of Taiwan and China diversifying a little bit. This stock has absolutely gotten nailed. I mean, this stock actually, you know, it was kind of been this in this range bound between like, I don't know, I want to call it 108, 109. And then the upper band was like 130. It broke out above that briefly. And it really feels like, and, and this stock did not participate. If you look at the outperformance in the semis last year, it was largely AMD, NVIDIA, uh, Qualcomm helped out there. But Intel sat out a large component of the SMH or the SOX. And so did Taiwan Semi, but this one really feels like um, investors are very concerned about something happening in China. I'm just curious, in the semi space, you know, there's two things that, that I worry about is that, yes, we've seen all sorts of manufacturers have issues as far as, you know, securing chips that are going increasingly into more, um, you know, consumer electronics, industrial, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but I also suspect you're seeing a lot of double ordering. Um, so I'm just curious where, where, no, where do you I, think of Taiwan I, Semi and... I think you're smart to bring up Taiwan Semi, and it's. I'm glad you mentioned it because I do believe, and you you can speak to this, Dan. It recently made it made an all time high. When I say recently, I want to say like mid January or so, traded up to 145. But again, that 108 level that you just mentioned, that is this. And here we are, by the way, we're at 108 right now. Huge support level. I mean, this was the lows we saw in October. This was the low we saw again in August before we bounced. And this is the low we saw in, I think, May before we bounced. Um, you got to hold here because I got to tell you, Dan, and you can speak to this because, you know, you do a little armchair technician on your own. Little. This stock has been in this in this range since my birthday in 2020. That would be December 18th, by the way. Mm -hmm. And if we were to break here, you know, you might give back a large portion of the move you saw again. From the March 2020 lows when everything was crashing 
to this recent high. So just keep that on your radar screen. In terms of valuation, um, yeah, Intel, you can make a compelling case on valuation. That's great, except that you know they, they're lost right now in terms of where the world is and where they are. To me, the most interesting one, again, continues to be Qualcomm, just in terms of valuation. I will say, Dan, and we were smart to bring this up two Wednesdays ago or when whatever. Uh, yeah, I think it was two Wednesdays ago. Uh, the move in NVIDIA. Uh, that move w- on the back of earnings, I think the stock was trading mid-250s or so when they reported, which was a great quarter. They gave great guidance, and the stock then proceeded to go down. I want to say, what, how low did it get, Dan? I want to say it got down to, what, two, 207, 208, so? which, was, which was basically a match low from, the, from mm-hmm. late January. And it really did – I mean, there was a huge reversal yesterday – um, or I guess on Thursday. Um, I mean, the, the, here, here's what I'd say about a lot of your favorite stocks that have gotten pummeled, even big names like NVIDIA, which has a $600 billion market cap. Keep an eye, you know, that, that January 24th reversal day, that was a big day that a lot of you know technicians are kind of pointing to. And a lot of stocks that got really ugly last week, you know, stopped almost to the penny of those um, January lows. And so, if we break those, um, it's lights out. I mean, like, it's just, it's kind of that simple, um, you know, and, you know, you and I are kind of in this similar camp here where, you know, we're not having a V bottom here, people. And, and and if you go back and you look at the last couple of times the stock market sold off significantly in late 2018, and then obviously in February, March of 2020, what happened in both instances is that the Fed got really accommodative. They got really dovish. And that just can't happen right here for all the points that Guy just mentioned. So, you know, I, I mean, listen, you and, and I just said, watch out for those January lows on Thursday. Apple, we just talked about when I can spend any more time on it, blew through those January lows. OK, open below them, but then had a huge reversal, you know, like, I don't know, five percent off those lows. So, again, watch those lows. I mean, um, that's that's what I got my eye on. All right, guy, real quickly. Let's talk about crude oil here. Um, I see WTI around 95 bucks, um, you know, kissed 100 last week. Oil stocks down a little bit today. Not 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 massive. Um, quick take on oil and what we should be looking for because you know this is just one situation with energy prices related to the situation with Russia and Ukraine. There's obviously you know a whole host of other things going on. Maybe the administration tapping the SPR. Did they say they're going to do that? Is, is, are they going to do it? I'm sure um, that there are talks about it. I, you know, again, that that would be. Well, it doesn't matter what I think. I mean, they shouldn't do it, but well, whatever. But this I mean, is this is kind of the reason they have it. Yeah, but it, it doesn't. I mean, yeah. No, I understand. It, that's yeah. I get. Uh, well, I, well, guys, but the only point I would just make is you, you didn't think they should do it last time, and and you were probably correct when they did it in late November. The really other than just kind of relieving the price, you know what I mean? It seemed political to your point, right? This is what they have that for, um, and so uh, you know, I mean, at the end of the day. You could have OPEC plus yeah, do something. See, There's a whole host of stuff that can. No, happen. but I understand. See, and I'm not trying to be nuanced at all here. But what I'll say is, you know, they're doing it to combat price, which is not what it's meant for. They, you know, if there are no supply disruptions here, I mean, when you go up to the gas station, last I looked, you're not waiting online, so it shouldn't be. Again, you follow what I'm saying? Like, yeah, you're not feeling the pain here in terms like you. You know, it's not every other day. It's not odd even like it was in the 1970s. Like they're not telling you you can't get gasoline here. The only the only inconvenience we have is vis-a-vis price. And this was not this was not put in place um, for, you know, for assholes like me not to, you know, not to pay more for their gasoline. It was put in place. God forbid we didn't have any gasoline and somewhat nuanced. I get it. But I think you understand the distinction. Yeah. well, I, I guess my point is, it, I I see it as not too different than the Fed and the and the microphone or the you know megaphone that they have from from the standpoint of just kind of jawboning stuff. And and you know the only point and and I what what else happened? So they tapped the SPR in late November. Well, that and was, was something I mean, else. Really and then, stopped everything was the Omicron was you know oh, that headlines came scare. out the, the Friday after Thanksgiving and that shut right. everything down and that sort of one two punch to crude oil from the 80s down i want to say 61 and obviously we got that all back and here we are so to an- look to answer your question um and, and and i understand the i totally get it and i, I i'm not running for office i understand 
believe me, I get all the things that factor into this. Um, but I'll say this. I still think I still think crude goes higher. I mean, one of the reasons I thought crude was going to go higher is because of what's taking place now. That upsets me that that's come to fruition. But, it, you know, it's sort of, you know, you have to sort of incorporate these things. I do think there are other factors out there. And there's supply demand imbalances. I mean, that's just fact. I mean, in terms of global demand, we're past the point we were prior to COVID. U.S. produces less. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's all out there. So the, you, again, this is not to you know you hear this all the time. It makes your eyes glaze over, but it happens to be true. The only cure for higher prices and commodities is higher prices. So it hasn't gotten to that point yet. I don't think. Now you're smart to point out that oil stocks are not participating. I think that's something to keep in mind. We've talked about this dozens of times over the last year or so. The OIH, for example, has been this very well-defined range, sort of 175, 180 on the downside, which we've touched a number of times. And this 240-ish level has been resistance on the upside. Personally, I think it's going higher, the OIH. But I, again, if you're trading and you're trying to be disciplined, it's not the worst place in the world to take money off the table. True that. Um, I do think it's also interesting, Guy, um, that, you know, I guess the issue is it's not about odd evens and getting gas. It's really like what, what what's the impact on the on the U.S. consumer? We know that we don't have all that stimulus anymore, the fiscal stimulus. And um, people have been spending on other things that they hadn't been in, a, in the prior two years or so. So, like, you know, we're seeing savings rates being depleted. We're seeing consumer confidence weakening. I It was interesting. I was trying to look at the news last night and um, see who was covering the situation in Ukraine. And MSNBC had Steve Kornacki, who I love. I think that guy's a stud. You know, you know Kornacki, he's like their their election night guy on the on the board. Um, and they were doing at ten o'clock a a ready for this a midterms pre pregame. I I could not believe it. Actually, it just seems so early to have Kornacki on the board. Um, but you know, I, it, they were showing some recent polling. I mean, you know consumers or voters, whoever respondents to these polls, they're really worried about the economy. And that says something really different about what's going on in the stock market. Because if you pull up where the stock market is, the S&P 500 is down less than 9% after being up 26%. And you've said this all the time. I mean, that negative wealth effect. And I think Peter Bookvar, a friend from Bleakley Advisors, said this last week in one of his notes, is that Every major correction in the market um, has a whole heck of a lot to do with the negative wealth effect from stocks going lower. It's exactly right. And, you know, it's interesting, they, Kornacki, I mean, I, I think they really, because now they're using him in sporting events as well. And wait yeah. till the, the NCAA tournament starts, you'll see them parading him out as well, which is fine. I mean, get some mileage out of the guy. And I think you're right to point out the midterm elections might as well be 10 years from now as opposed to November. There's still a lot to be done. But your point about, the economy. I think when people say they're worried about the economy, I think what they're really saying is, "Holy shit, I'm paying more for things. The economy sucks." I, you know, I'm not saying people conflate the two, but I think that's exactly what's going on. So nothing's changed in the economy here, except you're paying more for things. So if that means the economy is worse, I totally get it. But to your point about the market, the negative wealth effect. I've said this for a while, and I, I believe this. I think all consumer confidence is is an overlay of the S&P 500 chart. Again, not to suggest that everybody owns stocks. I understand that. But when people see the market go down, or let's put it this way, when, see, when people see the market go up every single day, they assume correctly, incorrectly, you draw your own judgments that the economy must be doing well. If the economy is doing well, then I can afford to buy that Starbucks or go on that trip or buy that car, blah, blah, blah. When the market goes down 20 percent in the course of weeks and they lead with it on the evening news, as they typically do, people get people sort of peek their head up and say, wait a second, what's going on? Uh, maybe I shouldn't be buying that Starbucks going on that trip. And you go back to October 2018 into December, consume, when the market went down, as you know, Dan, 19.9 percent in a straight line, consumer spending stopped on a dime. And that's one of the other things that spooked the shit out of the Federal Reserve at the time for them to reverse course. So I think you're right to bring that up. I am right to bring it up. Thank you for, for agreeing. That. All right, real quickly, I just want to highlight, um, you and I are going to do, it's our live streaming video series. We do it Monday through Wednesday at 1 p.m. We call it Market Call, MKT Call. It's at MKT Call. Check it out. We're going to be doing it live today. This one is definitely one we focus a lot more on charts, and we're going to hit a lot more catalysts. We're going to talk about 
um, a bunch of earnings this week that we're watching. And there's a few of them without getting into it, Guy. Um, I think tonight after the close, Zoom reports. And I think it'll be really interesting to see the stock is obviously down, I don't know, close to 70% from its all-time highs, down 31% of the year. It had a big reversal. Um, the options market is implying a massive one-day move tomorrow. Um, I think about, um, let me just tell you here, about 15 16% in either direction. But on average, you ready for this? This stock has moved in, I don't know, maybe the three years it's been public, about 13% workday um, a SaaS name. I think it'll be really interesting to see how the market reacts to that. Later on in the week, we're going to have Salesforce. And then we have Target. That's a name that you're really interested in or have been interested in Costco and Best Buy. So we have a bunch of retail names. It'll be interesting to see what they have to say, visibility has to be very poor. They're getting hit on a whole heck of a, you know, a bunch of fronts. Obviously we just mentioned consumer confidence, but supply chain issues, right? Inflation. So I think this will be a really interesting week, especially when you consider how much of the S&P has already reported, you know, in January and early February and how things might've changed dramatically just in the last few weeks. Look, nobody ever heard it. Well, I shouldn't say nobody. I had never heard of it friggin' Zoom prior to COVID, right? And you look at the move down to 114 and change the uh, literally the other day. I mean, that was a round trip. You go back all the way to March, April of 2020, which again, if you think about it, is remarkable for a stock that subsequently went to, I think, $560, Dan, did, right? Even maybe mm -hmm. had higher in the fall of 2020. It's just incredible that it's given it all back. You mentioned the percentage move in dollars. It's probably an 18 or so dollar move from where we are right now. I think a lot of people will say, look at what Square did last week or whatever the hell they call their company, Block, that huge move to the upside. And maybe Zoom is setting up for one of these because, you know, it is a Kathy Wood name. You have seen some of her names bounce. And maybe you could set yourself up for that type of trading bounce. And I get it. Um, and maybe that's the right trading play. You know, you buy this trough, which, it, again, it's probably $12 off the recent low, but still, you buy this trough hoping for a post-earnings bounce, and then you sell it again. Yeah, I, I mean, that was the trade in block, obviously, and these short squeezes and names that are down, you know, 50, 60, 70% can be absolutely violent. You know, it turns into a situation where there's no real long sellers left to sell down here if the news isn't much worse than expected, and then shorts sit there and scratch their head, and they're tripping over each other um, to cover because they don't want to be the last one short the stock. So... Um, I think that all makes sense, Guy. Um, one name um, I know that you and I like to chat about because we think it's really important from a market sentiment standpoint is Tesla. It's up 4% today. Um, you know, Elon Musk got some some Twitter love. Um, I guess he turned on Starlink, which is this satellite internet service over Ukraine. We know the Russians kind of, I think, knocked out a lot of the um, internet there. I mean, listen, you know, Elon, you know, I mean, there, there's plenty of things that he's interested in that make, um, you know, make you rethink some of the the stuff, the other stuff where you're just a bit of a goofball. Um, what's your take here? It had a huge, it literally, I think the low on 700. Thursday. It traded yeah. $700 on the screws. And now here we are at 843 or so. I mean, that's again, I mean, think I mean, it's incredible. That's a 20%, right, Dan? That's it. I yeah. mean, am I wrong? That's a 20% bounce guy. in a week. I mean, it's crazy, These the moves in these stocks. And it's not like this is a $5 billion company. Last I looked, this was an $830 billion company that's moved now 20% in the course of a week. It, it makes, it well, it makes sense in the context of what's going on. But if you think these are healthy markets somehow, you're yeah. mistaken. And by the way, in the last 30 seconds we have, not for me to wax poetic, but everybody's upset that baseball is not everybody. You know, I'm so upset about baseball. Ownership doesn't give a shit. The players don't give a shit. So you shouldn't give a shit. Back to yeah. you. Yeah, baseball sucks. Um, I will tell you this. Tune in at Market Call at 1 o'clock today because we're going to do a little charting on this Tesla thing. I will tell you, I honestly think even though it is down, you know, 843 from 1270 five or whatever the hell it was 1250 it's still one of the worst looking charts uh in the market and i'm going to tell you why so that's at one o'clock um today guys that's a this tease was, that's a great that's tease. what we call a tease so at mkt call check it out people one o'clock it's going to be streaming on i think it streams everywhere youtube live twitter live um with our partner open exchange 
um, on OETV. Um, and then we also put it in the podcast store after that. So follow it there. Thanks for joining us for Trading Spaces. I'm Dan Nathan. That was Guy Adami, CME Group. They sponsor these. They also sponsor our podcast on the tape that drops on Fridays. We do that with our good friend, Danny Moses. So check that out. We had a great episode on Friday afternoon. Thanks for joining us, guys. See you at Market Call, 1 o'clock today. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Trading